Welcome to Night City. Quicksand. Traffic jams. Black Adder haircuts. Love and rockets. That's how you do it. And I think this might be a Last of Us 2 Easter egg. Cuddles. Socks and sandals. Tunneling cars. Hippies. Video game. Assets. No. Feminism. Mmm. Feminism. Welcome to Cyberpunk 2077. A game about corporate scumlords. Published by Corporate Scumlords. <laughs> For goods, you expect top quality. Consumerism 101. Spoiler warning. This video contains extensive plot and story spoilers. Welcome back, masochists, to part two of Cyberpunk, the disaster movie. In part one, I discussed in great length the great lengths CDPR went to in order to guarantee that the launch of Cyberpunk 2077 would be an unmitigated disaster. And I reckon they did a bang-up job. So far, my review has pretty much covered a litany of failures, mistakes and deceptions. However, the only way to get a credible and comprehensive handle on this game is by dealing methodically with all the shit first, before finally assessing the core elements of the game. And more specifically, I'm going to be assessing the game we actually got, rather than the imaginary game people were expecting in their own heads. Because make no mistake, at its core, Cyberpunk 2077 is a vastly better game than most people are giving it credit for. I would go even further and say Cyberpunk 2077 is a better game than many people feel comfortable giving it credit for. In some ways, the current climate is like the anti-Emperor's new clothes. And in other ways, I honestly suspect a few critics are trying to appear a bit cleverer than they really are by criticising a game that is frankly cleverer than they really are. In the light of part one of this video, I would quickly just like to note the following as a point of order. The media has generally been reporting that Cyberpunk 2077 barely runs at all on last gen consoles and is appalling on next gen consoles. I have not played it on console at all, but that is certainly not the impression I'm getting from the comments section of part one. I will let you guys be the judge, but quite a few people have been posting that they're playing it on various consoles and it ain't anywhere near as bad as the news reports make out. So I would just like to point out myself that in my last video, I had a montage of bugs on PC. And just for the sake of clarity, you guys know that's a montage, right? That was all the best bugs I found over hundreds of hours of gameplay. The game doesn't actually look like that all the time. Sir Grumpsalot pointed out a factual correction after watching part one. The generally accepted narrative is that CDPR has been working on Cyberpunk 2077 for approximately eight years. And this is not strictly correct. Whilst the game was announced in May 2012, serious development has only been going on for approximately four years. And no, no, it's not a Smurf game. And up to that point, the company was primarily focusing all of its energies on finishing the Witcher 3 DLC releases. So whilst they might have been spitballing and theory crafting since 2012, it looks like the serious work most likely started in 2016. The other thing I would like to mention is the rather furtive conversations I've been having. I keep getting DMs from mates saying things along the lines of, 
I know everyone's saying this game is shit, but I'm really enjoying it. And they are not all on PC. I know people who don't like this game too, don't get me wrong, but increasingly I'm having private exchanges with people who are saying they like the game and they have racked up decent time playing it. And I'm talking 100 to 200 hours playtime as an average. Even one of my most reserved and considered friends recently stated that he thought the game was okay, but had some issues. And he's got over 300 hours played. And when the game gets fully patched and there is more DLC, he plans to play through it again. Look, you draw your own conclusions. All I'm saying is that the first-hand feedback I'm getting from friends and players does not neatly align with the general consensus I'm seeing in the mainstream video game press. Right then, without further ado, let's snap the gloves back on and let's get elbow deep. The overall game design. Cyberpunk 2077 has a multi-tiered story quest structure. The main story quest lines, the side quests, and the gigs, hustles, Night City Police Department scanner jobs, random encounters, etc. The main story quest lines are the showpiece event quests that drag you through the arch plot of the game. However, a fuck ton of the lore, history and flavour of the game is in the side quests, many of which are fully fleshed out. The rest of the side hustles bring you money, XP, loot and even more reason to explore the entirety of Night City. And in case you didn't get the memo, Night City is vast, beautiful and very well designed, with distinct areas with their own feel, which is worth exploring. I strongly advise you to combine side quests and side hustles and punctuate them with a bit of main story quest lining so you advance through all the content at a roughly even pace. If you blast through the main story quest line only, like most of the mainstream media did, <coughs> you will end up missing out on most of the history, context and background story and walk away thinking that the game is like several Call of Duty single player campaigns bolted together end to end. It's like a meal, you got your main course, your booze and your side dishes. You don't sit down and just eat all the fucking poppadoms and walk out of the restaurant and write a review. Well, you do if you're a mainstream gaming journalist apparently, and when asked about the restaurant later, no doubt they would say interesting and insightful stuff like, uh, it's a poppadom restaurant. Essentially, Cyberpunk 2077 is an existential and technological rags to riches story where you level up, loot, kill and improve your skills, abilities, gear and cyberware enhancements. You know the drill. Some of the quests were spectacular, many were excellent, but a few were dialed in. There was one quest where I went on a path of retribution and in real life I was determined to find this guy, get my money back and fuck him up. It certainly appears like the only options were to let him go or let him go and demand he leave Night City. I still lost all my money. Even if I killed him, he was unlootable. I was saving for a car at the time, so losing the cash was a real dick stamp. The quest ending just didn't make fucking sense. Clearly, I have a very different understanding of the term retri fucking -bution. The meditation quests were a very intriguing idea, although personally, I don't really mind transcendental meditation, I just wished they would hurry the fuck up. But most of the main and side quest content was literally top shelf gear. The game has a levelling system which I really liked, and I'm still trying to fully understand. You have main attributes and within those areas there are subsections with perks. You earn points for both and invest them both. The perk and attribute system is deep. The more you look at it, the more significant choices you can make. The perk and attribute system is also being widely lampooned as meaningless, with quotes like, it's boring, I put a point there and just get plus 3% damage. I call bullshit. 
The gear, weapons, mods, perks and attributes you have can be used to create some crushing builds which are incredibly diverse. You can have a crowd control shotgun build, a full tilt melee assault build, a cyberware brain melter, a stealth assassin or a run and gun machine gunner. It's surprising how perks in one tree can have very impactful effects on seemingly unrelated activities. You can make your quick hack cyber attacks do critical damage and then ramp up your crit values with your gear or with other perks. So yeah, when I see people claiming the perks are all meaningless and boring, well maybe they're not really looking into it enough. I mean you could make a stealth rolling hacks firearm build by specking into reflexes, intelligence and cold blood, so you know, you can have quite a lot of fun with this shit. My main criticism is that technical skills, e.g. crafting, is basically essential. It's just too bloody useful as it's an I win button for legendary gear crafting and upgrading. With the auto disassemble perk activated it's also a rolling passive XP gain whenever you pick up a piece of random crap off the floor. You collect, craft and hopefully don't buy loot because the price scaling is on the fucking piss. As a Patreon supporter rightly pointed out, it's a bit fucking daft that you can craft legendary weapons yourself, yet the cars are vastly underpriced compared to the often unaffordable high-end weapons. Some uh, supply and demand logic was entirely ignored here I think. You acquire melee and ranged weapons, clothes and armour, cyberware and all that tech boffinery. There are mods for nearly everything, you can upgrade gear if you have the skills. And yes, it's all as confusing as fuck for the first 10 to 20 hours until the penny drops, you get a handle on the mechanics only to slowly realise it's actually even more complex than you initially realised, but in a good way. Apparently the Division community are loving this shit because of all of the min maxing opportunities and I can completely appreciate why. The game incidentally has a multi levelling system because you also level up your street cred based on your actions. This seems at least to mainly impact whether you can purchase and or use certain high grade items, it also limits your access to certain content, it is effectively a dual levelling slash gatekeeping mechanic which limits what you can and can't use or do, particularly certain vehicles will not be offered to you for sale if you don't hit the required street cred value. That said, you get street cred pretty easily, so you know, go and punch some Buddhist monks and murder people and it will level itself up soon enough. As for your karma, no promises there. The earn as you use subsystem is brilliant, basically on top of your general levelling and XP based stuff, if you use specific skills you gain precise XP benefits from it. I'm not sure of the precise science but for example just running around a lot will eventually give you benefits in your athletics attributes. Hitting people with katanas gains you specific blade XP gains which you can invest. I love this shit. Fallout New Vegas was brilliant for this. Long after the formal levelling process was over you could still keep earning rare perks and benefits just from using a skill repeatedly. The fact that this game rewards you for using skills independently of your mainstream XP progress frankly makes doing stuff seem more meaningful. You know, just like in real life where practicing stuff makes you better at stuff. The hacking is the game within the game. I initially kind of ignored the cyberware minigame but as I progressed I became increasingly fixated with it. At one point I had to assault a location guarded by assorted snipers, bots and commandos and I just crouched on a rock and brain fucked the lot of them using remote cyber skills. I nerfed their defences, caused their circuitry to overheat, electrocuted them and they were all pretty much dead long before I went down in there and certainly long before anyone ever saw me. Late game the quick hacks take on a bit of a dark turn as you learn skills such as making people go berserk and kill their friends, forcing them to eat their own gun barrels and even making them go full Iwo Jima. You can literally make them pull out their own grenade and set it off in their hand. 
Like I said, it can get quite dark. I am not gonna lie, the game is quite daunting when you first fire it up. It's a sea of keybinds, new abilities, inventory and interaction systems and statistics and it jumps right up in your grill. My advice is don't be too obsessed with the details at first, don't be too precious. Resign yourself to the fact you will probably sell, drop, delete or deconstruct something unique or precious. Don't stress about it, just fake it until you make it. Do your best, relax and eventually you will pick up all the game systems. I'm sure like me you'll do some stupid shit. I got to level 5 before I even realised I had levelling up points to invest. I'm proud of that. And as stated before, the game does lack frankly needed tooltips in the UI, because you may well find yourself stumbling blindly in the dark and having to resort to guides to figure some shit out. I mean, I only found out by accident that swimming is a great way to level athletics, even though you only have to swim a couple of times in the game. Similarly, I was lucky to spot in the XP spam that manually turning off security cameras gives you engineering XP. There's a lot going on which you might miss and the game is not going to tell you twice, if at all. Combat the combat systems in the game are varied and a wig splitting delight. The firearms come in all shapes and sizes and broadly break down into three categories. Power weapons. These are basically traditional ballistic guns if you will. Smart weapons. These fire generally less powerful but self guiding projectiles. Tech weapons. These are some kind of energy-ish gun with the capacity to be charged up and most importantly shoot through cover and walls. On top of this you have melee weapons such as katanas, kukris, baseball bats, machetes and uh, a dildo truncheon which sadly I missed on the first playthrough, else it would have dominated my entire run and been in nearly all of my game footage. On top of all of this you have your cyberware implants which operate in tandem on multiple levels. You have cyber abilities to literally hack enemies and devices for subterfuge, infiltration or just to finger bang them in the ear until they pass out or die. You have implants that make you stronger and more powerful and you can have implanted weapons like mantis blades or gorilla arms which quite literally will fist fuck anyone on the wrong end of them. These themselves can be modded to apply specific damage types. They all have their relative strengths, weaknesses and effective ranges and all interact with the attribute and perk trees. I'd also note that on the easier game difficulties you can pretty much face roll casually with whatever takes your fancy. It's more a matter of choosing your personal style, but on the hardest difficulty a lot of your choices and tactics start to get more meaningful and important especially when you wander into higher level enemies by mistake. For example, you can spec into stealth and stealth damage and build a power pistol build which does off the charts silent headshot damage. You can go full retard and spec into brawling and strength, augment that with cyber implants and punch the shit out of people hopefully figuratively. You can spec into tech weapons and increase your charge up power and just drill people through the walls before they even see you. On top of this you have procs on weapons that have a chance to shock, poison, bleed or burn an enemy which in turn can be enhanced by perks, mods and cyber mods. I hope you're getting the general picture here, this is a fucking min max paradise. You decide what your playstyle is and sculpt that into your build and a surprisingly large amount of factors play into each other across the board and can be used to interact to max out poisoning chance and damage, stun or sheer brute force. It's a giant virtuous circle of build mechanics. This said, on very hard there will likely always be some enemies that could one or two shot you, 
So to some degree, you're either going to need speed, stealth, or strong ranged attacks. Because face planting into a bunch of high level mobs probably won't end well for you if you're unprepared. I will shamelessly admit that the gore and ultraviolence in the game can border on sexual at times. The guns sound meaty and have excellent animations. If you can't find one gun in this game that titillates you, then perhaps you might actually have no soul. What's more, I don't even like melee in most games, but in Cyberpunk I found myself loving the fucking katana, relishing punching people with gorilla arms, or just relaxing by beating people to death with a canabo. Basically you can choose to stealth or assault in any way you choose. You can bust out your blades and kick in the front door, or use more intelligent approaches like mine. Basically, pop my head up, twat them with some brain melting cyber attack, and then slav squat back down and eat a sandwich whilst their brains boil out of their fucking ears. Who said combat had to be a cardio sport? For the uh, more cerebral or lazy amongst us, you can go ham with cyberware and eventually get to the point where you can melt most enemies at range by making their futuristic space brain capacitor things go pop. Combine this with the self-targeting guns and you end up with a clever solution for people who want to play the game but don't like real-time combat. Some people hate first-person shooters but might love every other aspect of this sort of game. Fallout handled this with the VATS system which slowed time and allowed the player to select targets in a heads up display. Cyberpunk handles this with self targeting guns and cyberware, so you don't actually have to do any first person shooting if that's not your thing. The gear game is pretty good, although I make that statement with the qualifier that if you constantly wear the best in slot item in your possession and ignore how it looks you will inevitably end up looking like some kind of acid casualty from Burning Man. I shit you not you may well end up choosing to wear less effective armour items just to avoid looking like the fashion disaster that would arise if your 8 year old sister tried to dress your nan up like a prostitute. I discovered very quickly that gold moon boots, mini skirts and a revealing titty bra top are not a good look, especially on a male character. Subject to preference of course. You do you right? It's the very literal definition of player choice, because at times you will have to choose between camo mil-spec tactical pants that look cool as fuck, and ballistic armour reinforced gold coloured hot pants that make you look like a transvestite hooker, because the hot pants have 20% more armour. The gear game is a real test of pragmatism over ego. Personally, I would always go for the gold hot pants because ego is fine and all, but living to regret wearing gold coloured hot pants is better than dying in tactical gear. 20% more armour is 20% more armour right? And besides, I've got nice calves. That's a chat up line apparently. I guess if I had one criticism of the loot system it's that the unique legendary items that you find out in the world randomly roll as you open the box. Personally, I just thought this was silly and encouraged save scumming. Some of these items could roll with four mod slots on them, making them best in game, or one mod slot on them, making them pretty shit. I personally hate save scumming and try and avoid it, but I was forced to do it in this game because you've only got one chance to loot that box, and if RN Jesus decides to shit in your face, that's your entire playthrough fucked. I really think they should change that and instead of having them roll randomly, they should just be at max value. The Car and Bike Collectors Minigame The acquisition of cars in this game will quickly become your new obsession. I can't really talk much about the bikes because I just kept crashing them and couldn't really ride them for shit, but they are there and they are very fast. Driving around the Var City is your primary means of accelerating yourself to high speed and then smashing your face into a concrete wall with ballistic force. However, 
Vehicles also serve as a means of transportation, along with walking and fast travel points, which you only discover by driving past them. Additionally, most of these strategic locations only appear on your map once you have passed close to them. So there's a big incentive to travel on foot or by car early and mid-game. That and you get to enjoy the view, of course. The cars vary hugely in price, appearance and performance, but learning to drive some manner of relatively fast vehicle as soon as possible will help you zip around between busy works. You can pretty much carjack anything subject to passing a skill check, but even at low level there are cars you can snaffle temporarily for that quick point-to-point -point drive. Beyond that, there's a supply of level-dependent cars for sale offers you get through your personal comms and contacts. I frankly thought the vehicle minigame could only be faulted by a mission and the tricks they missed. Whilst a lot of the cars were excellent with incredible sexy modelling, I think in the rush they totally missed out a lot of comedy opportunities. One of the coolest vehicles I saw was a little van decorated by a clown. Could I buy it? Fuck no. Why can't you ride the mobility scooters? Why no ice cream vans? Given the game has a Chuck Norris easter egg, why is there no fucking ice cream van decorated with human skulls? Why no actual serial killer van? Why no camper van that you can actually sleep in? I don't know, given how much humour there is in the game, I just felt that the guys in charge of the purchasable cars had their serious professional business faces on and missed a lot of opportunities for a really comedic personalised game experience here. Driving the little shitty orange eco car is funny and all, but that joke gets old after about 10 minutes. Awesome vehicles, taken maybe a bit too seriously. Make no mistake, you will quickly get sucked into the grind of acquiring cars. Some are cheap and effective, like the Galena Gecko. Some are built like tanks and cost a fortune. They all have their own unique charm, even if that charm is being horribly ugly and terribly shit. It's up to you whether you faceplant into buying a random car or spend your money wisely. But considering the insane cost, I would consider carjacking cars regularly to see what fits you first, before committing up to 215,000 eddies on a possible bad call. Take note, all the cars drive differently, some very differently. Some are four wheel drive, some are rear wheel drive. There are traffic lights by the way, there are real pedestrian crossings. Cars perform very differently on different terrain. Nothing is going to give way to you when you're doing 150 fucking miles an hour through the middle of town. A sweet ride for the tarmac of the city might drive like a milk float in the deserts of the Badlands. High performance cars can be very hard to control when you're a novice, and you can very easily spin them out on tight corners and T-bone at junctions. I drive like a tard, so I found out it was best to learn to drive in a shit bucket first and then get progressively more exotic cars with experience. This said, the Thornton Galena Gecko, a nomad racer, is a superb all-round early purchase. It's fast, small, rides well over rough ground and does well in the city too. It's also piss cheap. Bikes are fun too, especially if your idea of fun is bouncing down 100 metres of road using your fucking face as a brake. I would however qualify and without giving any spoilers, it is entirely possible to ace this game without ever actually buying a car with your own cash. You can bimble along in a shit bucket, temporarily carjacking something nicer and whilst you progress through the game, let's just say you might uh, stumble across a few vehicles that you can keep as a forever friend. So yeah, don't think that a flash car is a requirement for total global domination. You can do the whole game in your crusty family car if that's how you want to roll. But I ain't going to go too heavy with the faux modesty mind. Nothing quite beats screeching down the streets in a supercar or heading out into the desert with a top shelf nomad vehicle like a Shion. I ain't going to pretend that I didn't become completely obsessed with the cars. The control system and car mechanics have come under a lot of criticism but personally, I thought the driving minigame was perfectly enjoyable. My main annoyance is that they're driving on the wrong side of the road 
with the driver's seat on the wrong side of the car. Just look at these filthy, uncivilised savages. Despite all the criticisms, 99% of all driving complaints can be remedied by adhering to the following sound advice. Remember that this is not a driving game. It's an open world action adventure game with driving mechanics. If you really want to experience bad driving, seriously go and try Halo Remastered for fuck's sake. Drive like you would in real life. That statement should come with a few caveats, but never mind. Remember, there is a brake. Know the performance limits of your vehicle. For example, some cars are very, very fast, but they can't turn a corner for shit. Watch out for clues like red lights, flashing crossings, braking vehicles, and screaming pedestrians. Believe it or not, there is a traffic system and other drivers, and any plans for high-speed car action has to factor in all the other cars on the road. Jesus fuck, I feel like someone giving a 16-year-old their first driving lesson. Most of the videos I see of people complaining about the driving are frequently doing 155 miles an hour in a supercar through the middle of town traffic, or trying to take tight corners at speeds that would be considered reasonable on the fucking Nürburgring. Do you think it would be reasonable to drive at 100 miles per hour through fucking Chinatown, weaving between cars and then trying to take a tight hairpin turn without braking? No, because you'll end up in the front of a fucking restaurant. You would crash, just like you will crash in this game. The driving in this game is not perfect, but it certainly isn't bad. To repeat something I said to a mate who kept crashing his car and blaming everybody else, I looked him in the eye and simply said, have you ever considered not driving like a cunt? I would note, however, that the minimap sat nav display needs something like a flashing turn soon warning, like a co driver navigator might warn you about. At high speeds, the minimap is functionally useless because the range is only a few hundred metres ahead of you, a distance you will cover in a fraction of a second at the top speeds of some of the vehicles. Basically, that means when you're thrashing along like shit off a shovel at 180 miles an hour, by the time your brain has processed the turn appearing ahead on the minimap, you have just enough time to touch the brakes before slamming into the concrete wall. A little left or right flashing turn symbol to warn you in advance, preset to show early based on your speed, would fix that shit right up. As a footnote to the driving minigame, however, remember that the most important thing is that you enjoy driving your ride. Maybe you like fucking bikes. Maybe you prefer pootling around in your exploding SUV or Japanese super compact car. It's your game and your rules. I admit my preference is nomad vehicles and my guilty pleasures are driving the taxi and stealing police cruisers. I shit you not. Drive what you enjoy driving, it's more important than the specs. This is why I was emotionally crushed when I discovered I could not ride the mobility scooters in game. Hopefully someone at CDPR is watching this video and this glaring omission will be fixed in a later update. And yeah, I keep banging on about it because it genuinely upsets me that I cannot ride them. Night City and the Game World Night City itself qualifies as a character in this game, in the same way that the ship was a character in the film Event Horizon. Sometimes a location takes on so much identity and imposes so much intent and atmosphere on the observer, it ends up being as significant a character as any of the main players themselves. The different areas of the city are stylized and frequently profoundly distinct. Some of the areas were so well designed and authentic I kept running through thought processes I might have in real life. Like, this seems like a bad area, I probably shouldn't hang around here. Fuck me, this must be where all the homeless people live. This area seems really corporate and emotionally bleak. 
My, my, there's a lot of sex shops around here. It reminds me of where I grew up. People probably only come to this deserted industrial area to learn how to power slide or murder their girlfriends. Or boyfriends. I'm not sexist. This reminds me of that shady motel in the desert where my ex-girlfriend tried to murder me. This deserted flood channel looks like a great place to hide a corpse. I shit you not, Night City is as full of character as it is vast. Some estimates put it at about twice the size of Los Santos in GTA 5, a game which incidentally, I never played. To put it in perspective, just to test the scale of the map, early when I was playing the game I saw a dam way off in the distance. Just to check if it was a real thing and not some fake background graphics in the distance, I drove towards it to investigate. Not only was the dam real, but it had a little town at its base and later I found out that there was a road on top of it which you could drive over. Even later, I ended up swimming in the lake above the dam. That is world building on an impressive scale. And sometimes, sometimes when I hear people slagging off the open world in Cyberpunk 2077, I can't help but feel that maybe they're not really doing justice to the scope of the game. This is one of the most impressive open worlds I've ever played in and I've seen a few in my time. I fully appreciate that a lot of people have damn good reasons for being angry at this game, but at least attack it for its genuine flaws. Because it has plenty of those. But claiming that the open world is shit, Night City is shit, the story world is shit. Really? Is it really? Because I have most likely played more Fallout than nearly any person watching these videos. And I love those games. And even by their standards, I rate Night City as a pretty fucking impressive open world design. I would also note that the vast majority of the map is fairly densely packed and populated with locations and activities. It's very well detailed, obviously laboriously designed and every area feels like a realisation of someone's ideas. I have not found anything particularly cookie cutter about this place and while some of the outlying areas in the Badlands and Southern Industrial areas are a bit sparse, you know, like the Skyrim map, the majority of it is busy, active and full of actual content and locations and shit to do. Put it this way, I have repeatedly got hit by traffic when jaywalking and been stuck in traffic jams in certain busy areas. On PC at least. The level design, art design in general look of the game appears authentic and lived in. Certainly to my uncultured eyes at least. And it's full of little flourishes which feed into this. Like when a certain person steals a family car and it even has a laundry basket and a bottle of detergent in the trunk. Although whoever has the job title of Principal Scatterer of Cards and Ashtrays in Cyberpunk 2077 really needs to take a fucking week off. Or you know, bust out the creative juices and mix it up with some uh, used condoms or knock yourself out. How about a pebble? The complete preponderance of random ashtrays around Night City, let's face it, is a bit odd. The level design was frequently well thought through. Nearly every single time I fucked up a stealth mission and ended up murdering everyone as punishment for my stupidity, I would nearly always discover some smart entry points as I walked out the front door, spattered in other people's blood. Rear entrances, roof access, gantryways, windows that could be prized open at the rear of the building, tunnel access or something. It was fairly routine to be leaving the site of a massacre and spot some hatch and find myself thinking, ah oh yeah, I should have sneaked in that way. I think because I was hammering this for a review, I missed out on a few things. I didn't really stop to explore the vendors, shops and cafes enough and generally hammered from one activity to another. I think I failed myself by never really using my apartment frequently. But the immersive RPG feel, kicking back and watching the TV reports of shit you might have been involved with, was a delight I discovered too late. I think if you're more of an immersive RPG type of player that likes a bit of RP when you play, you would probably routinely go back to the apartment, soak up the vibes and watch some TV. Maybe I was being a bit too utilitarian and simply fired off the thought process, no loot. No buff from sleeping. I'm out of here. I'll sleep when I'm dead. 
The soundscaping is excellent. When you drive off the road you hear dust and grit hit the underside of your vehicle. When you drive through tunnels the acoustic reverb changes to match. This combined with the multiple TV and radio stations in Night City frequently blaring out on some screen or radio helps to build a coherent and interesting sound environment. The soundscaping was clearly meant to be a constant dimension to the game experience, with my only two criticisms being 1. It's a shame I can't route the radio through my cyberware, an obvious oversight, and 2. The occasional random pop of what appears to be bottles smashing under my feet. Did anyone else get that? You'd just be walking along and you just get a random pop of a crush bottle. You got your comm system, text, shards, phone, you make your little fake scripted phone calls and your fake scripted text exchanges. It's all predetermined, that adds to the flavour. It makes you kind of feel engaged with the world. It's a bit fake, like a toddler's toy laptop, but the game making you engage with the comms was a nice touch. The in-game music was brilliant in Cyberpunk. Well, I say brilliant, some of it's horrible, but it fits the game perfectly. In art, just like life, you will find yourself carjacking some chod, giving him a quick tarmac flannel bath, stealing his car and immediately thinking, ah oh god, that radio station is offensive and quickly retuning it to something more civilised. The black metal and some of the pop is quite hilarious when you're doing crime. Some of the other music will grate. It's basically just like a real car radio, tuned in by someone other than you. You'll quickly discover how to retune that fucker quickly, even if there are gangbangers shooting at your vehicle. It's all about priorities, right? The music score of the game fucking excels. It didn't really hit me early on, but after playing longer it kind of got to me. Claire de Lune by Debussy was playing in one location you visit multiple times. Sad and beautiful. The acoustic guitar versions of Pon Pon Shit playing at random locations. Another sad yet beautiful rendition. Never Fade Away will always remind me of this Christmas. When you think about it, of course they did absolutely their best with the music score in this game. Music is a theme within the game. Johnny Silverhand is a guitarist. He was in the band Samurai. There are quests about music, quests set in nightclubs and gigs. The game is full of references to punk, rock and pop. Of course they weren't going to fuck up the musical element here. Different fucking factions have different music associated with them. The game is generally a collision of retro and modern, with acoustic renditions of in-game music, references to music such as Tracy Chapman and The Clash combined with a mostly modern score. This kind of fits the general arch narrative of the game too, the collision of modern and retro. I mean, that is a core fucking premise of Johnny and V's relationship, and it's also a theme of the game, the retro colliding with the modern day. Technology can keep changing but basic human nature, well that's been the same for eons. And similarly, the backgrounds and the technology might change, but the rich elites exercising crushing control over the poor and disenfranchised is a struggle that has been around for as long as there have been rulers, ruled, clubs and metal coins. I thought it was quite rich and authentic, apart from the fact that in the near future, Forget the future future, us peons ain't going to be living in such nice apartments. I felt the whole Blade Runner, Deus Ex vibe, but mark my words, when we inevitably end up living in that high rise high tech dystopian future, we ain't going to be living in apartments, we're going to be living in little rabbit hutches, pods, slots, compartments, like those Japanese kids who were forced to do it, and those fucking hipster idiots that are choosing to promote it. Well, at least they got the part about us eating food made from insects right. Yummy. Why do we have to destroy our bodies to find a job? Why do we have to pay off endless debt and yet pay higher taxes than a billionaire? Why are we afraid of the police more than all of Night City's gangs put together? Turn off your TV! That's right, come on! Now go and see how many blue screens in your neighbor's windows. That's how many of us there are. Think about what would happen if we all got up from our knees. United is one. The philosophical issues that weave through the game. 
There is a lot of deep philosophical shit going on in this game, and I was really quite impressed. Sometimes it was directly weaved into the plot or the world, and sometimes just referenced, but there was really quite a lot to give pause for thought. The cybernetics raised the whole spectra of wealth and access to technology. Life enhancing technology changes the world but serves the wealthiest in society first, as is always the case. The wealthy make money from selling technology, and the poorest suffer from having the least access to it. The simplistic view is that the more technology we have, the better quality of life we all have. But it never really works out that simply. Just like the age extending technology in this world. Do they give it to everyone? Fuck no. It's only the super wealthy who can afford it. It's like the digital divide. Computers have provided unparalleled access to information and learning online. But if you're one of the poor kids without a computer, you are now at an even bigger disadvantage than in the days when the school kids all read the same books from the same fucking library. Just like the cybernetic enhancements in this game. You would like to think everything is more awesome because of them, but they just become another driving force pushing apart the rich and the poor. The wealthy have all the top shelf implants they want, but the peons do increasingly desperate things just to raise enough money to repair the basic implants they already have so they can function within society, trying to keep up with the people who can afford even better implants. Within the game you even hear of people getting into debt or doing crazy shit just to get or keep their implants. Christ, it's like the futuristic equivalent of crushing, life-changing student debt. A giant fun bag of other philosophical issues are raised in the game besides. The nature of the human soul, social media scum lording, artificial intelligence, the corporatization of politics and policing, escapism, sentience and artificial life, the moral ambiguity of ultra-capitalism, formalised corruption, redemption, freedom, pragmatism, suicide, prostitution. They even reference post-famine insect-based protein foods. Although the funny thing is that we may well end up just having to get used to that in the future. I mean, red food colouring is often made from cochineal. In case you didn't know, that's crushed up beetles. So I guess eating insects is just a matter of perception. Notably, on one occasion I overheard a father and daughter arguing about the ethics of sex work. What is the morally right position here? Work as a prostitute for good money with all the risks that that entails, or work in a shitty factory for shitty money exposed to shitty chemicals that will kill you slowly? Suddenly, sucking a dick doesn't seem like such a crazy option if the other choice is poverty and an early death. Cyberpunk 2077 draws inspiration from the Cyberpunk Tabletop Law, Deus Ex, Blade Runner, Altered Carbon, Fallout, Judge Dredd, Bioshock, Johnny Mnemonic, Film Noir, Nihilism, and maybe even a little bit of things to do in Denver when you're dead. It also references the Ship of Theseus, Philosophical Dilemma, the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, the nature of the soul and the spirit. And of course, God. These concepts permeate the whole game. This is shit I overheard characters talking about, read in in-game messages, or got tossed up during quests and encounters. So for the record, when a reviewer said they beat the main game in 20 hours but didn't bother with the side activities, well that would certainly explain why they missed out on at least some of the best fucking content. Let's get real with the philosophy here. You spend a lot of the time in the game hanging around with a virtual construct of Johnny Silverhand, and you don't know if he is a real entity or just a mirror or ghost or copy of what he was when he was a living human. He might be essentially a trapped spirit, or just a very slick simulation. He might be a real person, or just a very sophisticated version of Skippy's algorithm. Technical specifications, HJKE11 smart gun with built-in AI. Is Johnny self-aware? Sorry to break this to you and spoilers ahead, so stick your fucking fingers in your ears if you don't want to hear this. But there is a big problematic issue in the game, for the player at least. 
You might not actually be you either. You might not have a soul. You might not actually be V. The only reason that you're alive is because of the relic chip in your head storing an engram of your personality. You got shot through the fucking noggin and that killed you. You are still in play as a meat puppet because the relic resurrected you. You might be the original owner of the meat suit, but you might be no less of a tourist than Silverhand. How about them apples? You might be playing a game as a character that is already dead, lost his soul and only exists as an engram on a computer, all the time judging Johnny Silverhand for hundreds of hours because you think he's just an engram on a computer. What an equaliser. I guess my big takeaway from Cyberpunk 2077 is that we live in a world where corporations are more powerful than governments, nearly all of us are pawns in some rich people's games, we are all just trying to get along as best we can and we don't know or fully understand the meaning of life. True in game, true in real life. Look, some people are going to play this game and skip over all of these themes and not even notice them. I'm not going to fault anyone for that. People play games for very different reasons. Some people are just going to pick up Cyberpunk and play vroom vroom motor cars and play pew pew lasers with their guns. I understand that. I'm just making the point that there is some thematically thoughtful, deep, dark stuff going on in this game, whether people noticed it or not. It is in the game. So when I hear people casually spit out, the story was shit, perchance, just fucking perchance, a slightly more fleshed out response could possibly be warranted. Well, because there have been a few fresh developments on the ground since I made part one of the review, and the Cyberpunk 2077 phenomenon is such a vast issue, and because I entirely failed at being concise, this review has spewed over into a third part. I guess that means I'm rewarding your commitment with more misery and punishment. So hopefully, in part three, I will neatly wrap this all up into a conclusion, tie a little fucking bow on it, and I will also be discussing some of the grave implications of CD Projekt Red's recent official statement video, which can best be described as an admission of guilt, a non-apology, or maybe just a load of corpo bullshit. I will let you be the judge. But for now, good luck and happy hunting.